Let's um, spend the next few minutes in the Word this morning. I'm really excited for our time together, and I've been thinking, I've been praying an awful lot about this message and preparing and revising, and if you're looking at the screen, you notice uh, as I've put the title of the message there, A History of Sin and Salvation, I, I, I usually... I'm trying to give you a, a kind of an idea of where we're going in terms of the Scripture. And you notice we're going to be in uh, Acts chapter 7. And we're going to cover verses 1 through 53 this morning, which is a lot of verses. It's a lot of verses. As we're coming into the book of Acts, one of the things that Luke has been doing for us is recording these speeches or sermons um, at several formative points in church history. And we've looked at several of these already. The, the longest two speeches that we've already seen come from the Apostle Peter. In Acts chapter 2, Peter's first sermon spans 22 consecutive verses and then three concluding verses after a little commentary. It's a pretty lengthy sermon that we considered back in Acts 2 many, many weeks ago. In Acts 3, Peter's uh, sermon before the Sanhedrin, the, the council that he was on trial before, had 14 verses that we looked at in that sermon. You're thinking, okay, well, that's you know interesting statistic, uh, but why does that matter? Well, I mentioned why that matters because... What we find here in Acts 7 is a speech given by Stephen that goes from verse 2 to verse 53. It's, it's the longest speech that we find in the book of Acts, and it's detailed. And if we want to talk in terms of word count, in English, Stephen's speech is 1,235 words. Peter's longest sermon back there in Acts 2 is only 570 words. Four words. In Acts 3, it was only 359 words in English. So 1,235 words that we need to get through and consider today. Well, we're just going to keep going until the harvest party tonight at 5, right? I mean, that's... No. So because of the length of this passage, we're going to have to deal with this in a little bit different way than we've been doing in Acts so far. If we did the verse-by-verse -verse look at Acts chapter 7 and we unpacked it the way that we've been doing through the book of Acts up to this point, we would need at least four or five weeks here in Acts chapter 7. And if we went and explored all the cross-references and looked at the stories that Stephen's talking about, as you'll see here in just a moment, there's a good chance we'll still be in Acts 7 by the time you've wrapped all the Christmas presents, put them under the tree, then unwrapped them on Christmas Day, and then put the tree away, and you're ready for 2020 already, right? Like, we would be a long time in Acts 7 if we wanted to get really exhaustive about this chapter. So rather than do that and kind of spend the rest of 2019 in Acts chapter 7, we're going to take a high look at this chapter. We're going to zoom in on just some of the key statements from the chapter, and we're going to try to explain and walk us through the argument that he is making but I'm going to encourage you when you go home today or maybe sometime this week to go and read all of Acts chapter 7. Though it would take a long time for us to expound it here in the message, it won't take you that long to read through those verses yourself in your quiet time. One morning you can read those in a block as one unit. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. But today I want us to kind of get this big picture look at what Stephen is doing and how this really does speak to you and I today in a powerful powerful way. So to remind you of the context of Acts 7 as we come into this, this speech that Stephen is giving, remember he's standing trial before the Sanhedrin, the council, on two specific charges. There are false witnesses, individuals that have been, been paid to, to say accusations against Stephen, and they're accusing him of two particular things. The first is that the temple that the Jews have there in Jerusalem, they're claiming that Stephen is telling everybody Jesus is going to destroy the temple, this, this physical building that is there. And the second charge they level is that Stephen is telling everyone Jesus is, cha is changing the customs and the laws of Moses. That basically what they're saying is th this man needs to be silenced because what he is teaching, what he is saying is going to unravel, is going to undo our entire religious system that we believe in as Jews. So Stephen's response to this is unique, especially when we compare it to sermons like Peter's sermons from earlier in Acts. What Stephen chooses to do is he chooses to tell a story. Rather, specifically, he chooses to remind the Israelite people of their story, which he shares with them. He is, as we've talked about, a Hellenistic Jew. And so his approach is to remind the people of this story of God's people. So if we start in verse 2, we'll look at the first part of Stephen's reply as he sets this up. Verse 2 tells us, And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. 
The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. So this is really a pretty good place for Stephen to start the story. If you're going to talk with Jewish people, a good starting point is with Abraham. If you know your Bible history, and it's okay if you don't, but Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. It's really with him that the, the, the Jewish religion and the family lineage of the Jewish people starts. It's with Abraham that God reveals he is going to be the one through his family line that God will fulfill the first promise of the gospel he gave back in the garden at the fall in Genesis 3.15 when God said, I am going to have one come who will defeat sin, who will destroy Satan, who is going to make everything back to this good state that it was at creation before sin entered the world. But notice the details, though. Stephen starts with Abraham. Look at what he highlights. He specifically mentions that God, he calls him here the God of glory, which is an incredible term. We could just spend the rest of the day talking about that term, but we don't have that time, right? The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Now, specifically, Abraham's in a place called Ur. And I, I was going to go through, I was going to have a map up here, I was going to show you all this stuff, but... I had to cut it out. We don't have time. i got to keep moving. Here's the, here's the reality, though. Ur is, is over here in Mesopotamia, and Abraham is called to go to the land of Canaan, what becomes Israel. Now, the way Abraham goes is he goes 700 miles north to a place called Haran, and then he settles there. This is what Stephen reminds the people of in Acts 7-4. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans, where the city of Ur was, and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living, the land of Israel. So Abraham goes 700 miles up to Haran, settles there. Now God had told him, follow me to the land I will show you, this land of Canaan, this place would become Israel. But instead of going there, he goes 700 miles up and stops. And it's not until his father dies and God removes him, it says, from that land that Abraham can, completes the next leg of the journey, 700 miles down. Abraham very literally went halfway in his obedience to God. Now, because Abraham only goes halfway, God has to intervene there. And God does. He's very gracious. God doesn't say, fine, Abraham, you're not going to obey me. That's it. We're not going to use your family, your line. Uh, forget about it. I'm going to go find someone else. No, instead, God intervenes when Abraham's father dies there in Haran. And Stephen says God removed him from there, from Haran, into this land that he is in that day talking to the Israelite people. What happens is God steps in and pushes, if you will, Abraham when he was disobedient and stopped halfway to where God had intended for him to go. And here's what I want us to note this morning is we're looking at some of these key verses and we're looking at some of these connections. I want us to understand this because while it's subtle here at this moment, Stephen is actually making a point with everything he chooses to highlight. And the point Stephen is making is even at the start of our history, if we go all the way back to Father Abraham, there's disobedience on the part of his people. Like all the great heroes that, that the Israelite people knew, all the people that they would look up to, all the people we read about in our Old Testament, the great heroes of this Jewish faith, they were sinners who were disobedient to God. But God, he's going to contrast God to the sinfulness of the people and show that God is a God of continuing grace and mercy and power and still accomplishes his plans and fulfills his promises. So here's where we find a real connection to us, to us today, right? Because you and I, we are disobedient people too, right? We're people who get content in life where, where we are. We, should, we know we should be growing, but you know what? Hey, we're, we're better than we used to be, and so let's, I'm fine. I'm going to settle in right here. We're the kind of people who, just like Abraham, will go about halfway sometimes in being obedient to God and doing the things he's asked us to do. We're people who do not obey God as fully as we should, and Stephen is going to make that point, but that's getting just a little bit ahead of ourselves. What Stephen goes on to recount in the story of Abraham is that Abraham doesn't actually take possession of this land that God has promised him. But as he gets there, God, God shows him that it's not just about Abraham himself receiving some land and, and having a place to establish his family. Rather, God gives him something bigger and better 
He gives him what he calls the covenant. It's a promise from God that this land that Abraham finally gets to after his settling in, after his disobedience, and then his move by the hand of God to the land. God says, I am going to give this land to your family, but that fulfillment will come through your offspring. The land will be given to them in the days to come. And again, we could spend weeks unpacking this, but I want us to see how Stephen shifts the focus from this land. Abraham's reached the land, but he's told you're not going to have possession of the land. You're not going to be able to settle in here. Your family's not going to just grow and this become your place now. In fact, what happens is Stephen mentions the great grandsons of Abraham, who he calls the patriarchs, and kind of shifts the story a few generations down the line. And Stephen, as he gets to the patriarchs, he focuses in particularly on one of these individuals. His name is Joseph. Maybe if you have a church background, you've heard the story of Joseph. It's a pretty famous one. If you've been to Branson in the last year, you might have even caught the show down there. They had a whole big uh, show. I think this was the last season of Joseph, or maybe it was the season before. But they do uh, some Bible story shows down in Branson at the Sight and Sound Theater. Really interesting. I got to see Joseph while it was down there. It was a, it was a great production. You might be familiar with this story. And Stephen knows, those listening to him, well, they are certainly familiar with the story. So he starts to unpack the meaning of the story a little bit. Joseph is the youngest son of this group of brothers, and he's the father's favorite. And his brothers hate him because he's the favorite. So much so they hate him that they really decide, you know what we're going to do to get back at Joseph for taking all of our father's affection and love and all that type of stuff is we're going to just kill Joseph and we're going to be done with this. But the very last moment, they, they kind of change their mind and they decide not to kill their brother, but instead just sell him into slavery and ship him off to Egypt a long way away and then go back and tell their father, oh, he died this tragic, horrible death so his dad doesn't go looking for him. I mean, these are really great guys, right? Nice brothers, wonderful family relationship here with the patriarchs. But again, if we, if we just stop to think for a second and we, we would analyze what's going on in the story in our own lives, we're the same kind of people really as the brothers are, right? I mean, we have evil desires. We get jealous. We have relational issues with those around us. We're, we're like these brothers who when we see someone else getting all the favor, all the treatment, all the excitement, when we, jealousy starts to build up in us instead of celebration for those people. And yet, the story of Joseph and his brothers shows us that God uses those evil people, even those evil actions, to accomplish good in the end. The Bible's filled with real people, broken people. And yet, from cover to cover, what we have found about God is that God is never surprised by us. He never has his plans thwarted. He's working in and through all things, even the things that we cannot, from our perspective, see. How could God, a good, powerful, loving God, how could he be involved in that? The Bible shows us God is involved in all of it to accomplish his plan and his purpose. That's the God that Stephen is talking about. It's the God that we come into this place to worship. And the story of Joseph shows us this like almost no other story in the Bible really can. It's a powerful story. It's a lengthy story. So if you want to go read it, you'd have to go back to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and read chapters 37 to 50, 13 chapters. You thought this was a long section in Acts chapter 7. That's a much longer section. But notice today the point that Stephen draws out in verses 9 and 10 of Acts chapter 7, about the story of Joseph and his rejection by his brothers and their attempts to get rid of him. He says in Acts chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, But God was with him, that's Joseph, and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. This gracious rescuing of Joseph by God was the means that God was actually going to use to rescue and save those rebellious brothers who hated Joseph from a famine that was going to come in just a few years. It's because of Joseph receiving this favor from God and then this favor from Pharaoh and this position that he's given that eventually the brothers move their families to Egypt. They don't stay in that land that Abraham had been promised. They go then to Egypt. They settle their families there. And this move of Joseph and the brothers' families in Egypt leads to 400 years of the people of God living in the land of Egypt and growing as their families grow and grow and grow over generations. But eventually, though these people came to Egypt for deliverance from a famine, they become enslaved and they become persecuted by the Egyptian government. And this leads us to then to the next guy and the next part of the story, jumping about 400 years. Stephen focuses in on another character that's very well known to the Jewish people, a man named Moses. 
Now Moses has a huge role to play in Israel's story. And Stephen, if he was going to recount all of Moses' story, well, we'd be here way beyond just 52 verses. But Moses, as Stephen recounts his story, starts with where Moses saves an Israelite who is being beaten by an Egyptian. And what Moses thought was going to happen from that is recorded for us in Acts chapter 7, verse 25. He says, he, that's Moses, Suppose that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. What Stephen's pointing out is that even Moses, the Moses, was rejected by this people, this family lineage that comes down from Abraham. They respond to Moses by saying, verse 27, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? And so in verse 29, Stephen says, So at this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian. After his rejection, after Moses thought, okay, God's raising me up to be the savior for my people. I'm going to deliver this, this brother who's being beaten by the Egyptian. I'm going to save him. And surely then the Israelite people, my brothers, are going to realize God is bringing deliverance through me. I am God's instrument for this. But instead they reject him and he flees and lives for 40 years in the wilderness of Midian. I mean, so already in just the people we've highlighted and zoomed in on, do you see this theme of God's people having a history of not obeying God, of rejecting the ones that God sends to them, and of doing evil and just missing the plan of God altogether? See, Stephen certainly sees this. It's the point he's bringing out. He's putting this emphasis into recounting the story of God's people throughout the ages. If we summarized up to this point, it would be this. God's people have a long have long misunderstood and even rejected what God is doing. But what Stephen has highlighted in each of these in the passages that we haven't read is that God always accomplishes His plan. Amen. Despite the misunderstanding, despite the rejection, despite the rebellion, despite the sin, God is accomplishing His plan. So Stephen continues by telling the people, listen, after that 40 years of exile in the wilderness of Midian, God shows up and speaks with Moses and says he is committed to fulfilling his promise to bring them salvation. Acts 7, 34, this is God speaking. He says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. So Moses, this guy who was already rejected, rejected like Joseph was rejected, who spent years in this other land in, in kind of exile away from where God had called him to be, just like Abraham had done. Now he's again being sent by God to go and accomplish the mission that God has committed himself to seeing accomplished. And that's the point that Stephen makes. He looks at verse 35 and 36. This Moses, he says, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And listen to how he summarizes what Moses did. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses, who is sent by God after this exile of 40 years, goes and does exactly what God intended, what God foretold would happen in this deliverance that he was going to bring. He's the instrument of God for 40 years beyond this deliverance. And yet the story that Stephen is recounting returns to this key theme just a few verses later. If you look at verse 39 in Acts chapter 7, yet our fathers refused to obey Moses and thrust him aside. The guy who came and delivered them from, from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, who did signs and wonders, miracles, they, he came and he delivers them, and yet they refuse then to obey him and thrust him aside. And in verse 41, they tell us how they responded further. They made a calf in those days and offered sacrifices to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. These people... This family line that Stephen's a part of, that the people he's talking to are a part of. He says, hey, remember how from the start with Abraham to Joseph and the patriarchs to Moses, how you people, our family, we have been people not marked by perfect obedience, but marked by disobedience and sin from the start up until now. The history of this people is continued rejection and misunderstanding of God's plan, rejection of the leaders that God has sent this people even. So even with Moses, who delivers the people, does signs and wonders in front of the people, who's the appointed redeemer for the people sent by God, Stephen reminds them, the people still ended up worshiping something other than God. Again, if we're evaluating our own hearts and our own lives, we're right here with the people in this. 
We are people who are so easily distracted from God by the things that God has made or the things we have made. None of us, I would bet, haven't been to every house in here, but I'm betting none of us go home and bow down to any statues of idols in our homes, right? Probably not a, a common temptation, but I guarantee each of us do have idols in our homes, things that draw our attention, our energy, and our focus away from God and onto themselves. Those might be our phones, they might be our TVs, they might be our jobs. Maybe it's our home improvement projects that we're trying to accomplish. Maybe it's our relationships with friends and family members. Maybe it's our hobbies or the dreams that we let ourselves think about too much about the future. Our idols are much less obvious to us when we think about the idols of Israel and golden calves and statues and things like that. But I, can, I assure you, our idols are just as real and they're just as deadly to our worship. We, like the people of Israel, are constantly drawn to creation, to the gifts of this created world, rather than to the Creator far too often. You and I are idolaters just like these people are idolaters. There's no reason to pretend we're not. There's no reason to hide from that. God knows it to be true. We know it to be true. So let's hear how God responds to idolaters in this story, right? In the midst of all the failure that Stephen is recounting about the people of Israel, the people that Stephen's focusing in on throughout this story, there's this gracious, faithful, loving God who keeps bringing the people back to himself, who keeps forgiving them, who keeps giving them mercy and grace even though none of them deserve this kindness from God. In fact, Stephen goes to mentioning now that God has continued, even with all the rebellion and all the faithlessness of the people of Israel, God continued to meet with them, to dwell with them, and fulfill His promises and His plan. Get to verse 44 through 45. This is what Stephen says. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as He who spoke to Moses directed Him to make it according to the pattern that He had seen. Verse 45. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they, did, when they de dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. Again, we could spend a lot of time unpacking this moment in Israel's history, but here's the two key points Stephen's making. One, he refers to what he calls the tent of witness. In, in the rest of Scripture, it's referred to as the tabernacle. This is the special place, it's the tent where God would come in and have this holy meeting place with Moses. That's the place where all the worship of God was to be centered and to take place for the nation of Israel during this time. And God gave them this gift of this place to come and meet with Him and worship Him. And they continued even to have that gift in the midst of their failures with sin and their rebelling against God. God didn't just destroy the tabernacle the first time they rejected Him or sinned against Him. He continued to give them that gift of place and calling to worship Him despite their brokenness. Having this place of worship in the tabernacle really defined Israel and their relationship with God in a significant way during that time in history. And we'll come back to the implications of that in just a second. But the second point, there from verse 45, we read that God drove out before our fathers the nations. When they come back into the land of Israel, the land of Canaan as it's called then, there are all these nations that are settled in there and they have to be kicked out so the people of God can take possession of the land that God promised them. And God does that. He empowers them and enables them to conquer the land and to settle in it and to have this land as their possession that He had promised Abraham that He would give to His offspring. And this is after, don't miss this, this is after more than 400 years after God established the covenant with Abraham. And this people, this family line, as we keep hearing, they were repeatedly failing and rejecting and wandering away into sin in various ways, yet God still fulfills His promises. God drove out the enemies, He gave them the land that He would said, because God is faithful even when His people are not. This brief, very pointed run-through of Israel's history starts to draw in, and Stephen starts to sharpen up his point at the very end of it. It starts in verse 47. It was Solomon, then, who built a house for him. That's for God. So finally, Stephen gets to talk about the temple. You remember, he's on trial for two things, for speaking against the temple and speaking against the law and the customs of Moses. And finally now... At verse 47, he starts to address the temple, the thing he's standing trial, the thing he could be killed for talking about. Finally, in verse 47, after building up all the history, he says, it was Solomon who built a house for God. This house that Solomon built, 
is the temple. It becomes then the place of worship for Israel. The tabernacle is kind of moved aside and the, the temple becomes the center of worship, the place of sacrifice, the place all of the Jewish religion really centers around there in Jerusalem. It's a magnificent building that Solomon invests tons and tons of resources in. It's the pride and joy of the Israelite people. And when it's destroyed at one point and, and, and conquered by other nations, it's, it's rebuilt back up into this glorious state. And for Israel in this day, as Stephen's talking to them, the temple is everything for their religion. But Stephen points out the meaning of the temple in a way that they should have understood and the people often failed to understand. In verse 48 through 50, he says, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, verse 49, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all of these things? Stephen citing from Isaiah 66 here, and again, we could go over there, we could spend a sermon on this connection, but on the surface, it's pretty clear what Stephen is telling these people here as he cites this verse, is listen, the God that we say we worship, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, he is so much bigger and so much greater than being confined to a single place like a temple that we have here in Israel. I mean, he's the God who has the heavens as his throne. The earth is his footstool. This entire planet that we have is nothing more than a place for God to prop up his feet and rest them. Like, this is a magnificent, much bigger picture of God. God creates all things, everything in existence. And so to think that a physical place like a single building, a temple in the city of Jerusalem, in this tiny little country of Israel, could be the center of everything for God? Well, Stephen says... You think that because of this idolatrous streak that has been running through this people from the beginning. In Acts 7, 51 through 53, Stephen starts to really sharpen up the point as he, we have what are his concluding words. He says to the people, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. I think Stephen says quite a bit right here, and I, I really think he's really just getting started, kind of applying this sermon to the people. But the people interrupt him here at this point. This mob mentality overtakes them, and we're going to look at that result next week. The point that Stephen's making in this speech in front of these people is, listen, you are just like all the other people that have gone before us in our family line. We all are sinners who are rebelling against God. And you people who are listening to me today, Stephen says, you are missing God's plan. You have rejected and killed the one that God sent to save them, Jesus Christ. And you, people of Israel, are the lawbreakers who are caught in idolatry. This is the point Stephen's making. And there's a connection here that I think really would challenge us in a phrase that Stephen's been using intentionally. And we've just kind of glossed over because we've been going so fast in this overview through Acts 7. In verse 41, Stephen had said, The people who sinned with the idolatrous worship of the golden calves back in the days of Moses, he said they were rejoicing in the works of their hands. In verse 48, he reminded the people, The Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. Back in the prophecy that Jesus gave, if you remember last week's sermon at all, we talked about this being one of the reasons they put Jesus on trial and then they were now attacking Stephen was this, this teaching that Jesus gave where he uses the exact same phrase in Mark 14, 58. People said, we have heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands and in three days I will build another not made with hands. This phrase is actually littered all throughout the Bible and the New Testament is picked up in several places. This exact Wording is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, several more places in the book of Acts, Ephesians chapter 2, just to name a few. In fact, if you were in Sunday school this morning, you heard this exact phrase out of the book of Hosea as well. What it means is this. When the Bible says these works of our hands, it's referring to our human accomplishments, the things that we can achieve or we can obtain or we can do in our own power. This is the root of idolatry in Israel's history that Stephen is pointing out to them. It's the root of so much idolatry and sin in our own lives right now, too. The temple for Israel had become a great symbol of their accomplishments 
of their power, of their works. It was the work of their hands in this really real way. The temple was actually designed to reflect something far greater than a mere building. It was designed to point them to Christ. It was designed to point them on towards eternity with God. But the people became captivated by the thing that they could see and touch and enjoy right now. They got focused on that instead of the real meaning behind it. And so as Stephen has recounted the history of this people, he's telling them, listen, our family from the time of Abraham who started it until this very day has been marked by rebellion and sin against God. He's telling them, listen, you too are marked by rebellion and sin against God. You are guilty of focusing on the work of your own hands and missing what God is actually doing in our day. Jesus, he says, came as the righteous one. He was the fulfillment of the covenant with Abraham. He's the fulfillment of that first promise of a redeemer from Genesis 3, 15. Jesus was the one who was fully obedient. He's the perfect deliverer. He's the greater Moses. He's God himself come to be with his people and you killed him. Jesus came to destroy our self-righteousness and to bring true salvation. But you, he says, rejected him and you killed him. You misunderstand what the law was designed to teach us all along. It was to point us to Jesus. You have broken the law. You people who are religious leaders in this day sitting there listening to Stephen, he says, you've broken the law by your continued sin, by your idolatry, and by crucifying the one who has come by the hand of God to save us. This is the third time this group of people, this religious council, has heard the gospel message, been confronted with their sin. Twice Peter has been before them and explained this to them, and now Stephen is laying out the same message, proclaiming Jesus as their Savior, and they continue, just like their forefathers, to disbelieve and to reject the message. Look, as we wrap this up, Stephen is reminding us as well today that all of us are sinners who have rejected God and failed to uphold the law. God, despite how broken and sinful and full of failure our lives are, God continues to be faithful to His promise, though, and gracious to people. This is what you and I need to hear today in our lives again and again and again because no matter what sins you have in your past, no matter what sins you might have in your life right now at this moment, you are hearing the message of a God who continues to be gracious and merciful to those who come to Him in faith. God sent Jesus, Stephen's point is, after so many generations of rebellion and rejection and sin that these apostles will stand before the very people who killed Jesus and explain to them, you should repent and trust in Jesus who came despite your sinfulness. In fact, he came because of your sinfulness. And the call of the gospel in every era is this. If you respond to Jesus, if you come to him in faith and trust, then God will graciously forgive all of your sins. All of the rejection that we have done of Him throughout our lives, all the idolatry that we've filled our lives with, He will be merciful to those who come to Him by trusting in faith in Jesus Christ. Hear me today. This good news is the same good news that the people of Stephen's day needed to hear that you and I need to hear. No matter our backgrounds, no matter our failures, if you come to Jesus and believe He is who He said and accomplished what He said He did, then He will forgive and He will redeem all of your life. I mean, think about that for a moment. The worst things that you can think of right now in your life, the things that you think, man, God, that, that keeps me from God. God's promise is that He knows all of those things already. And He will not only forgive you the punishment that you are due from them, but He will actually redeem them and use them for good in your life. The patriarchs are used by God, despite the fact that they, they tried to kill their brother, decided then, okay, we'll just ship him off to slavery and then lie to our dad about him being dead. God actually used them to further the kingdom and further the plan that He had laid out. If God can use those type of people, He can certainly use us. This is the message of the gospel. So don't think, don't think like the Israelites thought. Something external is going to save me. They, they thought, we have the temple. We have the temple. We, as long as we have the temple, we go to the temple and we do the sacrifices, we do the worship there, we're fine. We're good. No, the temple could not save them. And nothing external, nothing apart from Jesus Christ will save you and I today. Listen, being in church today, I'm glad you're here. Would love to talk with you afterwards. Love to see you tonight for the event. But listen, being in church today is not going to save you. Only faith in Jesus Christ will save you. So the way to have salvation is to come humbly 
before God in faith. Right now, place our trust and our faith in Jesus as the only righteous one, as the one who fulfilled the promises of salvation, who gives salvation to those of us who ask for his forgiveness and experience today his love and his mercy as we trust in him. I'm going to pray, and wherever you are right now, you can ask God for mercy and forgiveness right there in your seat. If you want to talk about that more, if you have questions about what that is, come talk to me as soon as we dismiss in a moment. But don't leave this place missing the point. God's people have long had a history of rebellion and rejection. You have maybe a history of rebellion and rejection in your life, but God responds graciously to those who ask him for forgiveness. Let's do that today. Father, I thank you so much for our time together today. I'm thankful for the, every aspect of this worship service, from the, from the coming in here and lifting up our voices to sing praise to you, to giving, acknowledging you're the provider of even the material things we have, and especially, Lord, for this message that you have communicated to us through the text of Acts chapter 7 and the history of your people from the beginning of the Bible until right now, showing us that you are a gracious God who brings salvation to people who don't deserve it. This room right now, God, is filled with people who don't deserve your grace and mercy, myself included. We're not good enough. We're not holy. We're not righteous on our own. But we can come to you today, and I pray everyone in this room comes to you today and asks you to work in us to bring forgiveness, to bring a new life, to give us the mercy that we don't deserve, yet you have so graciously offered to us. I pray that today is the day that we, we trust most fully in you, Lord Jesus. That we see the point, that we understand our need, and we come to the only one who can meet our needs and the only one who can meet, give us the salvation that we really ultimately have to have. God, I pray that you work in every heart in this place today. I pray that this, as we leave this place, we go about all the things we maybe have scheduled to do for the rest of the day. I pray, God, that you would keep this message and this offer of salvation in our minds and in our hearts that we would respond to you today and to the work that you are doing in us. And I pray that you make us the people who then share the message of this good news with those around us because this message is needed by everyone that we know, Lord Jesus. Help us be faithful witnesses to you, I pray. We ask for your blessing upon us as we go. And I pray that you draw us back together this evening for a wonderful conversation and times of fellowship this evening. It's in your beautiful name that I pray and ask these things. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.